Hello and welcome to episode 142 of Killer Hangover. I'm Beth. I'm Bettina. Hi. Hi. We oh. had quite the uh, run of it tonight trying to get started. Man, electronics, baby. Electronics, baby, you know. <laughs> I think we're in for a long night. <laughs> oh, well, honey, you look terrific for running up and down the stairs five times. <sighs> Thanks, mom. Thanks. I think it's the uh, getting some sun, a little pop of blonde in my hair. Yeah. Yes. I, I was go. just telling mom I'm envious of the pink in her cheeks. <laughs> well, that's because I just came in from doing yard work. <laughs> I feel like I was going to pinch mine and give myself some blush. <laughs> oh, <sighs> yard work. Yeah, you're having a lot done at your house. You have your house painted. Let's not talk about it. Let's not talk about it right now. It's uh, painful. Bring it down. <laughs> I'm sorry. It should be done by Wednesday, but yeah, we're it's having our the longest house project painted, ever. Our whole house painted, and yeah, never mind. I'm just <laughs> we've been our windows have been sealed for the last two weeks. Yeah, I was there with all the kids. They were all sealed. We were very sealed in a project that should have taken three three maybe days. four days maybe we're on the second week so yeah I'm so sorry it doesn't help that we keep having all these thunderstorms and like no the storms don't help but I don't think they were going to come out anyway so oh yikes yikes oh well it'll be done uh, by Wednesday I have faith well summer is winding down for us over here school is starting soon it's our last week of squeezing in all the fun. We're checking off that list of things that they made. We're almost totally checked off. Kansas yeah. City has the uh, Spider-Man exhibit down here at Union Station. So that's one of the last things that we're going to do this summer with the older two is go to that and then out to dinner and just kind of just the four of us uh, before school starts. Oh, Jeez. boy. Oh Jeez. boy. Well, mom, those pink cheeks are not just from yard work. From they're a, not because I have a little drinky drink you're drinking I, over there. I aren't have they? been drinking <laughs> my drink while I've been waiting for you to get back on. So <laughs> it's just sitting here. I'm thirsty. Sorry, sorry not sorry. sorry. You got to uh, enjoy your beverage. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you listeners can probably figure out, I have the paranormal and I have the drink. It's been a I'm while since drink. mom's done the paranormal. Do what? No, it has been because I've been picking up, picking up the true crime. Yes. Let me pull up the recipe for this. Um, <clears throat> did you make it? I did send it to you. Did you make it? Uh, it has like 12 ingredients and I didn't have all of them. <laughs> okay. Well, this is what it looks like. <laughs> oh. That's very green. Are you going to drop some glowing ice cubes into that one? Oh, that would be cool, wouldn't it? That'd be so <laughs> cool. I feel like um, I feel like something's going to happen to me after I drink this. <laughs> it's very green. It's like, what chemicals am I putting inside of my body? Wow. What made it so green? What is in that? This drink is called swamp water okay last week and, we had a bright yes. orange drink and this week we have a bright green drink we have a swamp water excuse me okay for those of you who like sweet this is sweet i would assume so with the ingredients you sent me very sweet um it's sweet i added more tequila just to cut out some of the sweet but okay, so swamp water has two ounces of tequila, mm. three ounces of sour apple pucker, three ounces of melon liqueur, two ounces of sweet and sour mix, three ounces of lemon lime soda, and a splash of 
blue caraco and the Curacao. garnish yeah is Curacao. lime lime and cherry skewer which i don't have i didn't see no <laughs> So you fill your glass or pitcher with ice and pour in tequila, apple sour pucker, melon liqueur, sweet and sour mix, and lemon lime soda. Stir well. Add a splash of blue curacao and garnish. Is it and curacao drink- or curacao? Like the country. Blue, the blue drink. <laughs> I don't know. It's that blue stuff. <laughs> that blue stuff. And drink responsibly. Oh boy. So what does it taste like though with all of those fruity does it just taste fruity? Well the sour? apple the apple pucker adds a definite sour, but I like that. So I taste tequila, believe it or not, with all that other stuff in it. I taste tequila. Really? Um and I taste, I, I'm happy it calls for the soda because it adds some effervescence to it. Otherwise it would be it like. Adds, it adds something other than a liquor. Yeah. <laughs> I think everything has alcohol in it besides the True soda. That. <laughs> well, the sweet and sour mix doesn't, but. Just lots and lots of sugar. Else. <laughs> <laughs> everything else. Yeah. My sugar count is going to go skyrocket. I told Tom. You gonna take some of this? He tasted it. He said, "No, no. What's a hangover waiting to happen? A killer hangover." <laughs> I won't. Be well, this is fitting because I I didn't want to not drink. I'm having a Bud Light seltzer, but it's green but too. It's green. <laughs> oh boy, uh, fun stuff. Yeah. Okay. Swamp, the swamp swamp water well cheers mom cheers Mm. okay (sighs) i have missed telling a true crime story oh well then you can take the next couple ones (laughs) mom has been helping me out with the baby so by taking the true crime stories given me a little little extra time to jump into things but I was excited to cover this one um okay this is an oldie but a goodie all right (laughs) and obviously true crime is never good but it's a very uh entertaining story all right okay you'll see all right the year this is an old one so the year is 1895 the Victorian times we are in San Francisco, California. Okay. I didn't do San Francisco. Okay. <laughs> I did Delaware. I know. <laughs> okay. Calm down. I know. Okay. Okay. The year is 1895 in San Francisco, California, in the pretty park overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. We have a little meet cute. John Dunning is riding his bike through the park when it breaks. Mm. He stops. He gets off of it. And as he does this, he locks eyes with a woman sitting on a bench overlooking the Golden Gate Bridge. It was an instant connection. It was love at first sight. To him, she was beautiful. And he knew the moment he lay eyes on her. He just had to talk to her. That was very scandalous for the time. This is Victorian time. So a man and a woman talking before Without being, a companion. Well, before properly being introduced even oh. with a with a companion. It's not it's, it's very scandalous, but he just had to talk to her. The woman. Oh, this drawer just opened all by itself. It's not even the paranormal portion yet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I don't know why that happened. Uh, the um, the woman was Cordelia Botkin. She was 41 at the time. And John was 32. 
So let me share a little bit about Miss Cordelia. She was born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh. Uh, she was born and raised there. I just said that. <clears throat> yeah. We don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. We don't know much about her growing up. The next date we know for sure is September 26th, 1872, when she was at the age of 18 and she got married to a 33-year-old man named Welcome. Welcome? Welcome. Okay. (laughs) I did not know that was a name. I didn't either. But... (laughs) I'm still a little shooketh. Okay. Is it spelled well, like welcome? Welcome. It's like she gave birth to the baby and the nurse was like, oh, welcome. Like, welcome to the world. And the mom was like, oh, I'll just name him welcome. Okay. That's a bad joke. That fell. That fell hard. Okay. <laughs> really anyway. Hard, like splat. <clears throat> Oh, shoot, my notes. Okay, sorry, I lost my place. So she gets married. She's 18. She marries a 33-year-old named Welcome. He's a wealthy grain broker. Don't know what that means. I just know that was the title of his job. Sounds like he's financing. He's a broker broker for grain. grain. Yeah. He sells grain. Okay. Uh. I don't think he'd be a, a a grain salesman. He doesn't sell well, it. No, he He's a broker. The, he works with the salespeople. Okay. Uh, they have a son named Beverly. <laughs> in 1874. Okay. In the late 1880s. My notes do not make sense here. I'm sorry. I have written down late 1880 salesman armpit packing company job in Stockton, California. So I guess he gets an armpit packing job. An uh, armpit I don't know. Package. What? I have no idea what I even meant there. I apologize. He got a job and they moved from Kansas City to Stockton, California. Okay. Uh Yikes. Uh, Now, I must explain Cordelia to you. She was described by others uh, as stocky, stout, and frumpy. Not me. That's what other people said. Uh, Here's a picture of her if you're watching on YouTube. Um, Mom, I'm going to text you a picture because you need to see what she looks like. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so yes, that is Cordelia. She's just pleasantly plump. Pleasantly plump. Uh, yeah. John thought she was absolutely gorgeous enough, though, to for yeah, you know, you'll see what he does. But um, yeah, that's Cordelia. But you know, so they call her frumpy and stout and and all these lovely terms. But Cordelia did not think this of herself. Oh no. She believed herself to be the it girl. She oh. was a very big deal to herself. She was very cocky. Um, now, Welcome, her husband, Welcome, was very prim and proper. And Cordelia, she, well, okay, so she posed for photographs. And back then, that was you know a big deal. And she posed in very centralized photographs. So she would pose with like her hands behind her head. So making the eye go to the her face and her bust. I mean, they were very so the these Victorian were sexual times. Type? I yes. mean, not naked, but sexual. Correct. So she's very sensual in these photos. So here's Welcome, who's very prim and proper. And she's a very not, let's just say, <laughs> uh, ahead of the times. I don't, I don't. Welcome did not welcome this idea. So she bragged about these pictures a lot. She was very proud of them. And as you can see where I'm going with this, the 
marriage didn't really wasn't really working out and you can't really get divorced back then so you just kind of separate and go on with your lives but you're still married oh yeah. yeah so she moves to more of a party scene in san francisco and he's in stockton california wow uh and this happened in 1894 so she moves to san francisco with her son and she had been in San Francisco for about a year when she met John Dunning in the park. In the park. Day. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And she was, she looked like this. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Um. Okay. So now John, John was a big time reporter for the Associated Press. He traveled the world covering wars and America's dealings in the world He had just gotten back from overseas, actually, when he had taken out his bike to get some air, and he met Cordelia in the park. Now, Mr. John was married as well. Oh. He had married a woman named Mary Elizabeth. Yes, sorry. Mary Elizabeth. They had moved to San Francisco in 1891 and they had a daughter named Mary. That's why I got confused. So I'm just going to call his wife, Mary Elizabeth and Mary is going to be the daughter, but you get it. Okay. Uh, Mary Elizabeth did not like San Francisco. She hated it. She really missed her home in Delaware. Okay. There's where Delaware there's Delaware. Yes. This week we are covering a true crime paranormal from Delaware. That's why mom was confused. So, I mean, but really, really think about it. Her husband is off overseas all the time or working all the time. And her family, she doesn't want to be her family and everybody is in Delaware. And she's just left in San Francisco with her baby. And I mean, she made a couple friends like she uh, like this older woman named Miss Corbally. Um, They became close friends, but. She was really homesick for Delaware. She did not like being there. And then her husband's gone all the time. And as you can imagine with how he made moves on uh, Miss Cordelia, their marriage isn't the greatest Mm -hmm. either. So now John is locking eyes and falling in love with Miss Cordelia in the park. (laughs) And the two start an intense love affair. I mean, it was so intense. The two didn't even hide it. Oh okay. my gosh. What John loved most about Cordelia was that she was kind of like one of the guys. You know, she's a guy's girl, drinking the beer, she'll go gambling, she talks about sex, and she's just she's a guy's girl, you know, one of those fun girls. I'm a guy's girl. I'm easy going. Uh took he she but, but she took him to brothels, party scene. So okay, I am sorry, but this lady does not look like any of that. That was Cordelia, though. That was what she did. Oh my god. She really introduced him to the party scene. And I think that was kind of his pull to her as well, as it was new and it was exciting. And so yeah, that's crazy. He, he was enamored by her. So they're partying together openly. And Mary Elizabeth, she hears about this pretty, I mean, gossip starts to swirl. She's absolutely embarrassed. Her marriage is in shambles. She's lonely on top of all of that. I mean, she hates where she's living. Um, And then her husband is gambling all of their money away. Oh, no. And he acquires a ton of debt. I mean, he is deep, dark hole in debt. Oh, no. And so then, you know, he gets this great idea. Well, maybe he can just like, you know, take some money from work, like, you know, steal it, gamble that and then return it. Take the big bucks and then return it. And nobody's going to find out. Well, he stole $4,000 from work, which today is equivalent to like $126,000. Holy smokes. They found out he got fired. So he is in this hole. Uh, He and Cordelia are all loved up somewhere. He's in this just super dark place. Um, She and his wife has just had it. She moves back to Dover, Delaware. Good for her. She moves in with her family, her mom and her dad. And she just 
tries to, uh, she takes Mary, her daughter with her. And so her dad was, his name was John Pennington. There's a lot of double names here. Um, John's her husband, but John Pennington's her dad. And he was an active congressman at the time in oh, Delaware. Okay. Um, but she re- she moved home. She just tried to get away from all of the crap in San Francisco. Well, John now is in this deep, dark hole. And he's realizing, I messed up. Like, I am, I I really messed up. And he starts talking to Cordelia about how this is all kind of a mistake and he misses his daughter. He misses his wife. Uh, and he starts kind of like sharing this with Cordelia, um, you know, little things like uh, Mary Elizabeth loved sweets. She just, she, uh, I miss the fact that she just loved cookies. She loved to eat sugar and sweets and swamp water drinks. I really she'd like the swamp water. <laughs> uh she, you know, I real she probably didn't drink alcohol at to be honest. Uh, you know, she's Cordelia's opposite, but he really missed her and he started to share this with Cordelia. So now it's 1898 and they're on the brink of the Spanish American War, and the Associated Press is looking for a reporter to cover this. And John, I have no idea how. The man stole a ton of money from them. He gets the job. I thought he I wasn't I, working for them anymore. They hired him back. They, they, they're like, we really need a really good reporter for this. You stole a ton of money from us, but hey, come come write for us. You know, it's uh, the Victorian times. The men kind of got away with a lot of stuff. So he's like cheated on his wife. His wife's moved away. He's out, you know, gambling away other people's money. But here, here's a great job for you. But he takes this as a sign and he's like, you know, this is, this is, this is my sign to turn my life around. I got this great job back. I miss my wife. I'm going to go and I'm going to travel and write about this war. I'm going to turn my life around and I'm going to come back and win my wife back. This is just, I, I made a mistake. And he tells Cordelia this and Da, 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 da. she hates it she hates this she begs him to stay she begs him you know go do your writing piece but be mine like you're you're mine i love you so so much she's devastated john heads to cuba and cordelia heads to depression she is just absolutely miserable without john she can't believe that he left her like this so now we're going to speed on over to Dover, Delaware, and see what Miss Mary Elizabeth and her little Mary are up to. I mean, they're okay. They're making a life for themselves there. Uh, she's living in a pretty nice home with her, her family. And uh, her sister lives nearby, so she gets to see her, her sister and her niece fairly regularly. Well, Mary Elizabeth starts getting these letters from San Francisco, these handwritten letters, and they aren't signed. But they're informing her of the goings on of her husband, John. Uh, the letters share that John was gambling, John was partying, and John was seen out and about all over San Francisco with this absolutely stunning woman. Oh, no. <laughs> I know who's writing those. <laughs> and so she's getting these letters for like four or five months. She's just constantly getting these handwritten letters. And she doesn't really think anything of it. Like she doesn't let it really bother her. She she's well, keeping she, them. He was already gambling. I mean, he was already screwing around. She knew that. I know. So it's just rubbing her face in it, I guess, some more. But so she just put the letters in a drawer in a room and just kind of like didn't really think anything of it. So she okay, so August 9th, 1898, there's a knock at the family home and it's a delivery. It's a small package for Mrs. John Dunning. The package is wrapped in brown paper and twine. Inside, she finds chocolate bonbons wrapped in brown paper tied in a pink satin ribbon on a handkerchief. There's also a note. It says, with love to yourself and baby, Miss C. How sweet. Some sweets Don't from eat her em. old Don't eat friend, Miss Corbally, that I had mentioned before. 
She puts the chocolates in a cabinet. They would be perfect for a little after-dinner treat. Oh, no. Mary Elizabeth's sister is visiting with her daughter that night. The family all sits down to dinner. They have trout and corn fritters. Now, this is the olden days. There's no air conditioning. So after dinner, after all the cooking and the stove's on, it's really hot. They all go out to the porch to kind of catch some breeze and just relax after dinner. So the family's all out on the porch and she's like, oh, this is going to be the perfect opportunity to share my chocolates. So she oh, goes inside and she grabs her chocolates and on her way out to the porch, she pops three of them in her mouth. Oh, she I mean, does like sugar. I, but like the fact that she didn't pop one in her mouth the moment she opened the box, good for her because I would have opened the box when I received it and popped a couple in my mouth and been like, yeah, I guess I'll share them. But she pops three in her mouth and she brings them out to share. Her daughter has a piece. Her niece has a piece. The neighbors had come over to enjoy the evening on the porch. So they each have a little piece. Her mom has some. Her father passes. He doesn't want anything sweet. Um, she and her sister, they kind of go at it. They really start to have lots of chocolates. This reminds me of me and my sister. We cannot say no to chocolate ever. And you got that from your mother. <laughs> I will never turn down chocolate. So after a couple hours, everyone starts having some major tummy aches and soon the vomiting begins. Oh. I mean, everyone is getting sick. Dad calls the doctor and the doctor's like, yeah, you got food poisoning. Probably from the corn fritters. That's pretty common. Yeah, and dad's like, dad's like, yeah, no, I'm fine. And I had corn fritters. And the doctor's like, well, I guess you're lucky. And then he leaves. So the vomiting intensifies for Mary Elizabeth and her sister. The others aren't feeling the best, but they're seeming to get a little better. Mary Elizabeth and her sister, they're in like intense pain at this point. So dad calls another doctor and this doctor's like, uh, well, it's not food poisoning. I think it's real poisoning. And I can't do anything, so good luck to you. Sorry. You're going to die. Yeah, have a good day. Mary Elizabeth and her sister, they do end up dying from poisoning. And their death was absolutely horrible. Uh, they're vomiting. They have intense pain of the stomach. Um, they're bleeding. Um it's their pain is so bad they're delusional at the end um i mean they pass away slowly and and just horrifically i mean it's a horrific death their dad he's got to find out why he just lost two daughters how why who all the questions like what is going on he takes the remaining chocolates because he's like this has to be what made everybody there's some sick. left mm-hmm that must have been he a big takes box. The remaining chocolates to a local chemist, and he finds reports of arsenic in the chocolates. Fun fact, but arsenic is was fairly easy to get your hands on back in the Victorian times. It was used to clean things, uh, but it was also used when they mixed it with vinegar and chalk. Women would mix arsenic with vinegar and chalk and use it on their skin, on their faces. Uh, to lighten their skin, high society women would, because oh. you can't have sun because that means you'd be in, in the you'd be in the fields, so you have to. <laughs> they wanted them to look themselves to look pale, and they would use arsenic for that. So, Dad calls John, and gets a hold of him, and he tells him of Mary Elizabeth's death. John drops everything that he's doing and he rushes to Dover, Delaware. Now, as he's traveling to Dover, dad, who, like I said, his name was John Brown Pennington. I'm just going to keep calling him dad. I like calling him dad. Um, <laughs> dad is going through his daughter's things and he discovers those letters. Those letters, yeah. And when John Dunning arrives to the family home, he confronts him because he's like, you've been gambling. That's why my daughter came home. You've been partying. You've been having an affair with a very attractive woman in San Francisco. 
And John takes one look at the letters and he knows the letters had to have come from Cordelia herself, which gets the men thinking after comparing the letters, with the note that the chocolates came from, the men are certain that the chocolates themselves had to have come from Cordelia. Dad is mad and he wants justice. He yeah. calls the police in Dover, Delaware, as well as the police in San Francisco to figure out who do I get in contact with? Who's going to look into this? We need to find, we need to, we need to get this woman. And they honestly, they get to work right away. The San Francisco police chief, his name was Isaiah, Isaiah Lees. He wastes no time in building a case against Cordelia. Um, but first they have to prove it was her. They have to have proof to take her to trial. Here's another fun fact is this police chief, uh, chief Lees, he kind of invented the mug shots, like Oh, really kind of kind of not kind of did um he made it a regular thing that when somebody was arrested they would take a picture of that person and so that they had it for their records mm -hmm. and it's like the first police station that did that and he like some police stations would do that but he did it with every single person that was arrested and so come this time in 1898 they had like the largest collection of mugshots. collection of yes of pictures of people that they had arrested. I thought that was really interesting. Anyway, the chocolates arrived in a brown paper with a pink satin ribbon. And this was kind of a given as to what store this came from. There was a store called George Haas's Confectionery, and they wrapped all of their treats in brown paper and pink satin ribbons so police head to the four stores they had four stores in san francisco of george haas's confectionery and they start questioning all the clerks uh, how do you i don't even know because they can't have like a leading question right like right so anyway um they find a clerk though that remembers selling half a box of chocolate bonbons in july to a quote short stout frumpy woman <laughs> The clerk remembered this occasion. If everybody described me as, as short and stout and frumpy, it's like horrible. It's terrible. It's horrible. But uh, yeah, the clerk kind of describes what Cordelia looks like. So the police were like, okay. And the clerk remembers this occasion particularly because the woman only got was gifting this box but it was only half a box that she was buying and the clerk thought that was really odd like why are you only buying half of a box to gift to somebody like that's kind of cheap um and he even asked like so only have a box today and she answered well i'm also gonna add in some of my own homemade chocolates Ooh. to the gift and he thought that was really weird too but that was kind of, that was kind of odd. So now remember how I said the chocolates had a handkerchief in the package. Well, the handkerchief had a price tag still on it, leading oh. investigators to the city of Paris department store in San Francisco, where a saleswoman, Grace Harris, remembers the woman she sold the handkerchief to. Wait, this just a minute. Just... Short, stout, and frumpy. <laughs> Actually, no. Actually, oh. no. Uh, this is just so bizarre. But the woman remembers exactly who she sold the handkerchief to because she remember this woman looked identical to the saleswoman's mother, her dead mother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, she showed a photo of her dead mom to the police, and she's like, I swear. This woman looked just like my dead mom. Here's a picture of my dead mom. And they're like, oh my gosh, that looks just like Cordelia. That's so weird. And the, that's how the clerk was, the sales lady was like, yeah, I remember selling this handkerchief exactly because she looked like my dead mom. I thought that was so weird. <laughs> I don't know why. They also found uh, the love letters between Cordelia and John, which was, had the, they sent it to a handwriting expert. Mm -hmm. So between the chocolate letter, 
the letters written to Mary Elizabeth about the all of John's doings and the love letters between John and Cordelia, they all matched. On October 28th, 1898, Chief Lee presents this case against Cordelia to a grand jury. Although the case seems pretty solid, there's two holes in this case. One was that not all of the remaining chocolates had arsenic, okay? And the woman's bodies, Mary Elizabeth and her sister, their bodies, there was never an autopsy done. So there's really no proof that these women died from poisoning. Oh, no. So... Yeah, but but Cordelia was indicted on two counts of murder, and she was arrested at her sister's house a few days later. So although there were holes, she was arrested. Now, police thought they'd go in, tell her, you know, we got you. Come with us. You're going to come and confess, and you're going to jail, right? They thought it'd just be easy peasy. Uh, They go to her sister's house, and they said, pack your things. You're going to jail. And she goes, okay, wait right here. Oh, no. And she packs a huge trunk. I mean, a giant trunk of all of her gowns, all of her stuff. I'm it going to the Ritz. <laughs> two police officers to carry this trunk to the car. Oh, no. She's, she's like, you told me to pack. I mean, I don't know if she was just wasting time or that's just, I think that's just who she was. <laughs> Remember, she's a big deal. So this is a very, this case was a very big deal for its time. There's a lot of firsts in this case. This was the very first murder by mail ever. Okay. Uh, death by chocolate, that's, literally. That's M-A-I-L. Yes. Yes. This is the very first. And, you know, it was also a first, the first time that two jurisdictions kind of battled it out against who's going to cover the San Francisco, Delaware. I mean, they even sure. were, they were even fighting about where the trial was going to be held. And they were like, well, we can't send her to Delaware for a trial when she's never even set foot in Delaware. I mean, we're so, talking, we're talking clear across the country from each yeah. other. Um, so they were kind of fighting it out. San Francisco did end up winning. So that's where the trial was, but they were really fighting. Like she died here. We should have it here in Delaware. Um, but she'd never, ever been to Delaware why would we extradite her there but anyway the trial started in San Francisco December 6th 1898 she pled not guilty uh this was a media circus this was a huge deal um think about it nowadays we have our reality tv we have our dirty tv you know what I mean like where all the dramas had Jersey Shore the cheating scandals all that kind of stuff right this was that back then you had gambling, you had an affair, you had murder, like you had just this entertainment, all the juicy stuff, all of this juicy stuff in this one case. So this trial was huge. Everybody wanted to see every little part of this case. She wore a black dress with a white hanky. She looked like she was attending a funeral every day. She was done up. Is that what she has very- on? big uh basically i think so in that picture yeah um the media ex- described her as quote smug self-satisfied cunning little woman unquote uh yeah so the day that john dunning it was his turn to take the stand the crowd multiplied even larger because they're like we have to see this man who drove this woman to kill his wife. I mean, this guy's gotta be just dropped dead gorgeous. We gotta see this man. Uh, they were very let down when when John took the stand. Um, people were pretty let down. They newspapers described him as quote whiny. Uh, they also, but, but the, you know, but they did say you know quote he has a good cleft chin unquote so there's there's a positive thing i i think uh but quote narrow shoulder thinning hair so yeah he was not as handsome as i think they wanted him to be it was no clark kent 
Uh, now, the defense took the stance of, uh, when he was on the stand, the defense questioned him, who all have you slept with? Who all have you cheated on your wife with? Um, How can we prove that this was Mary Elizabeth, or sorry, how can we prove this is Cordelia who killed Mary Elizabeth and not one of your other lovers? And he refused to tell them any of his other mistress's names. He said, I just, I can't remember him right now. So they put him in jail and then they had him come out the next day and they asked him again, can you give us names? He said, I don't remember their names. I'm I'm not going to tell you. They put him in jail again. They put him in jail for four nights. He refused to ever share any of their names. That's probably um, the most, the, the on most honorable thing he did in all of this which is very ironic since he was cheating on his wife that's not very honorable but the fact that he wasn't going to share these women's names and drag them into this because then the media would go after them so he was you know he wanted them to focus on the trial and not the drama yeah but he wanted them to focus on the trial and not the drama Mm -hmm. of everything um so that was honorable which again i think is just so ironic but uh she had no alibi she said she'd purchased the arsenic to clean her straw hat. And that's that's all. Uh, three weeks of trial. And uh, on the day of closing statements, there were so many people at the courthouse. And I think this is so funny, but the examiner came up with this great idea. So, because, you know, it's a small courthouse, so you can only have limited people in the courthouse. And so what the media would do is they'd send somebody in and then when something would happen, they'd run outside and then somebody would have to print it up. It was just this long process of getting the media out there. So the examiner's like, I got a great idea. So he came up with live news. Okay. So they built this big billboard in front of the courthouse out of wood. And the reporters would run in and out of the courthouse with any updates of the trial and they would post it on this big board so the people that couldn't get into the courthouse by paper like they would paint they post it up there on the billboard and i i just like that's so cool i mean it's like the it's like twitter like (laughs) now like that's (laughs) right outside the courthouse that's what they did uh so the people that were all out that couldn't get into the courthouse they got live feed essentially of what was going on inside. I thought that was so cool. December 30th, after four hours of deliberating, they convicted her of a murder. And February 4th, Judge Cook sentenced her to life in prison. And when they updated the board outside of the courthouse of this, the crowd erupted. So she's carted off to San Francisco jail. Okay, the story is not over (laughs) so it's a couple months later it's a sunday and judge cook is out shopping with his wife downtown and he sees cordelia who he thinks is cordelia but she's supposed to be in prison for life didn't he just condemn her to life in prison what is going on he swears that this woman out shopping downtown is cordelia he doesn't approach her. He doesn't say anything. Just kind of launches an investigation, secret investigation into why she's out. Cordelia had been exchanging sexual favors uh, for a while with the uh, guardsmen. And she was getting out of prison. They were letting what? her out whenever she wanted. She was oh filling that God. trunk, more gowns. Uh, she had a private jail cell. She had comfy pillows, very thick mattress. She pretty much had the freedom to leave whenever she wanted. Um, Judge Cook worked at a case against the guards, but nobody talked. Nobody admitted anything. And when word got out, when Cordelia heard what was the secret investigation of what was happening, she's like, you see, it wasn't me. I didn't kill her. I've been in prison this whole time. I have an evil twin. Somebody's out there who killed Mary Elizabeth. It wasn't me. I have an I'm evil laying, twin. I'm laying here in all my comfy pillows and my mattress in my private jail cell. 
I didn't. I, I wasn't out shopping. Anyway, it was her. It was Bull. But anyway, she died in prison on March 7th, 1910 at the age of 56. Her official cause of death was, quote, softening of the brain due to melancholy, which was depression, which is a fancy way of saying she died of depression. I softening guess. of the brain? Softening <laughs> of the brain. <laughs> that is the story of Cordelia Botkin. OMG. <laughs> death by chocolates. Isn't there a movie or something? A book? There should be if there isn't. <laughs> I don't think there is, but maybe. Death by chocolate. There should be. Definitely. That was fun, actually. I mean, I'm sorry for Mary Elizabeth and her sister, but that was... Well, and you know what gets me, too, is that letter with the chocolates is for yourself and baby. So was she intending on killing Mary Elizabeth and little Mary? Like, that's horrible. Well, she wasn't a good woman. Uh, no. <laughs> she was just a woman in love. In love. John Dunning. Oh, John. So my iP- iPad is picking up what I'm saying. I said, she wasn't a good woman. And it said, good question. <laughs> didn't wasn't even a posed question oh all right mom electronics i am so ready for this swamp story okay i actually have three legends from delaware (laughs) excuse me okay okay so man, so if I would have made a drink, I would have made some kind of a chocolate drink for sure. And I almost Definitely. did, but I didn't have time because the baby woke up four times after I put her down. Okay. Here we go. <sighs> the first one is the witch tree. It's located in the Great Cypress Swamp. Swamp? (laughs) Swamp? Near the southern Delaware border. The name could be derived from the very gnarled branches of the old chestnut oak tree, which stands, or I should say stood, because now there's just a stump, but stood. Did somebody Among cut it down? Among much younger trees along the edge of the swamp. Did somebody cut it down? Yeah, it was it was old, and it was actually dying. Oh, oh, so they cut it down. I mean, the rangers cut it down. Yeah, but the tree had a history. I learned that it was a witness tree. Have you ever heard that? A witness no. tree. A tree that was once used to mark property, but a tree that was witness to historical events like the Civil War uh, and Revolution. I mean, all those wars, it's a witness tree, so it has witnessed events. That's interesting. I know, right? I've never heard of that before. Yeah. Hmm. People visiting the tree, and now the site of the tree, have reported bright lights and orbs around the area. Spook lights. Huh? Swamp? Spook lights. You should have put those ice cubes in your swamp water. Only problem is they're your ice cubes, not mine, and I don't have any. (laughs) You said you wanted to get some. I assumed you'd gotten them by now. I do want to get them. I just kind of forgot about it. (laughs) Some saw a man in a truck reading a newspaper. The only problem with that is there is absolutely no way a truck could go back there by the tree. So Why? It, there was, it, it's like a really small ledge that's by the swamp. So a truck cannot drive back there. Weird. Was so, there- there used to be a road or something it was a ghost trucking man 
a ghost, a ghost trucking, trucking man. man. <laughs> He's a it sounds like a country song. He's a ghost trucking man reading a newspaper. <laughs> it's a horrible tune. We got to change the music there. We got the lyrics, that's for sure. <laughs> We could go on with those. (laughs) People have heard screams, crying, and disembodied voices. Locals warn not to venture into the swamp alone at night. It's very easy to get turned around, and there's a very good chance that you will not get a cell phone signal. And when you do get to your car, there is a high probability that your car will not start. There you go. Yikes. There you go. Interesting. you're stuck out the, there. The swamp That's is also... Scary. Now, this part is super true, okay? The swamp is called the burnt swamp. Because the other parts of your story weren't true, Mom? I mean, come on. No, they were totally true. Totally um, true. In 1930, a moonshiner still exploded, causing a huge fire. The oh, fire no. burned for eight months because of the peat layers in the swamp of the what layers the peat like in ireland they go they get the peat and they burn it in their fireplaces and stuff i have no idea who peat is (laughs) p-e-a-t peat (laughs) peat and welcome we gotta add that to our our lyrics of our country song <laughs> so yeah pete is a great like um fire starter and it's like burning logs it, it's a slow burning fuel i guess so interesting and it's all over the swamp so this fire this explosion kind of went underneath the peat so it it burned for like eight months crazy i thought that was pretty interesting just saying Our next legend, number two, is also from the Great Cypress Swamp, this time in Shelbyville, Delaware. The subject, the Shelbyville Swamp Monster. I love it. He lurks in the swampy terrain. This is an entertaining story. This part really happened. Okay. This has really happened. I mean, mom, all of this is so factual. (laughs) You you can't, you don't, you don't, you don't need to emphasize that mom. We know that all of this is true. All of it. Early 1960s, Ralph Grapper. Oh, so when people were very sober in the sixties, got it. Mm -hmm. No, just listen. Ralph Grapperhouse, an editor of the local paper, and his friend, an actor named Fred Stevens, thought it would be great fun to... Yes, yes. What's fun, Mom? (laughs) To make up a monster that lived in the Great Cypress Swamp. Okay. Okay. So Stevens, the actor, used his... (laughs) Used his aunt's old raccoon hat a scary mask and a wooden club and he would hide at night on the edge of the woods along route 54 and jump out at passing cars oh my god did not take long for rumors to get started about the swamp i'm sure on april 23rd 1964 a picture. So did he do swamp. that for four years? He did that. He's just a laying picture. in bed and he's like, I'm bored. I'm just going to go out and dress up. Night's the night. Mm. Eh. <laughs> I'm bored. Nothing on TV. picture of the swamp monster made it to the front page of the Delmarva News, which led to several other local news agencies to pick up the story. And then the monster frenzy really started. <laughs> Oh my gosh, he's going to be famous. People went out to search for the monster. And amongst those people was actually Steve. 
and Ralph. They went out with the people too to search for the to monster. Pretend, oh my gosh, that's fantastic. <laughs> the monster. That's fantastic. Um, so <laughs> because this was in the news, it had to be true, right? I mean, that's the way be. it is, right? Even mm -hmm. today. Uh so the two masterminds of the monster kept up the farce for several months, but then two the two decided it had gotten out of hand and stopped the prank. Ugh. But not realizing Why? Well, but not revealing it was them until 23 years later. <laughs> In well, 19... Hold on. So they just said, ah, guys, it's a prank, but it's not us. No, they just let it go. They just kind of... Oh, they just stopped doing it. They, they just stopped, stopped doing dressing it. up. I see. Yeah. Of course, you know, it had already started. So people saw things still, you know, <clears throat> but... Oh, I'm sure. They, they didn't come out and say it was them at all until 1987 oh my gosh Stevens shared what he and grapper house had been quiet about for so many years so here's the strange thing sightings of unexplained things in the swamp were reported before uh grapper, grapper houses and steven's pranks so before that prank things had already been seen really though in the and they 1920s, just got their timelines all mixed up. Oh. In 1920s, because remember, they did that in 1960s. In 1920, hunters reported hearing a loud, inhuman, inhuman, inhumane, yeah, <laughs> inhuman. <laughs> ah, I could work too. Scream, followed by sounds of something very large and heavy running towards them. That would be scary. Be Maybe scary. it's what Bigfoot. Uh, then in the 1930s, there was the fire that I mentioned. Remember the peat fire? <laughs> the peat monster. Okay. And an old man. Now, different stories. It was either the moonshiner, you know, who still exploded, or it was a shingle maker. <laughs> okay. Either no, one. Okay. The old man died in the fire. People reported seeing his spirit haunting the edge of the swamp. So what is it that lurks in the great cypress swamp? I'm telling you, his name is Pete. And he, he has been pulling these pranks for years. That Pete, he and George not to get together. Again, my jokes are falling just splat bad they're bad yeah they are <laughs> all right legend number three legend number three i'm gonna change locations but i'm not gonna go very far okay <laughs> okay mom it doesn't <laughs> take long place. for the ride <laughs> it doesn't take place in a swamp i'm okay. sorry instead it takes place in a cemetery which is about 3.6 miles north of shelbyville Okay. So we're not going to go very far. Okay. And this cemetery is called Long, L-O-N-G, Long Cemetery. Most of the graves date back to the 1800s, one of which is the grave of Colonel Armwell Long, who was buried in 1834 in what would later become a cemetery bearing his name. I'm sorry, what was Long the name? Long was a veteran of the Mom? American Revolution. Yes. I'm sorry. What was his name? I know. I said it right. <laughs> arm well. His arm is well long. Okay. Arm, arm well, well long. I looked it up. <laughs> it was like, is that he really and, right? He and welcome are, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if those are family names for anybody. I have never heard either one of those names arm well okay okay all right i mean i'm sorry but can you just arm well you better get your butt in here it's time for dinner welcome let's go it's time to go stop playing the Thanks. welcome i really don't understand and then what was their kid's name <laughs> beverly his name was beverly yeah that was the other one okay so arm well was buried mm -hmm. in 1834 
in that cemetery. Um, and he was a veteran of the American Revolution and the War of 1812, as well as being a very good friend of George Washington's. Okay. But this legend isn't about. Wait. What? He was a good friend of George's. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. My math was really bad. I had to like, I was like, well, the Declaration of Independence was 1776. He died in 1834. So they, he died old. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how old. <laughs> I mean, because this story isn't actually about him at all. <laughs> Sorry, I'm dwelling on Armwell. I just wanted to tell you that because I know you're interested in that era. And so I just wanted to tell you that little story about Armwell. I'm but so nothing... interested that that's why I'm dwelling on it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but now you can stop because it has nothing to do with him. <laughs> let it go, Beth. Just let it go. <laughs> Move on. Got it. Okay. okay. This He's legend. buried there. Moving on. This legend is about Leroy Hudson. Leroy was the caretaker of Long Cemetery. He took his job very seriously, including the job of scaring teens away from the area at night. Unfortunately for Leroy, his facial features closely re resembled that of a cat. Mom, I told this story. No, you didn't. I did. Catman. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen one of these days that we were going to tell the same story twice. Okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll say something that you didn't. I was literally saying I was like, I feel like I've covered a long cemetery before, but <laughs> you know that name is very common. And then like, you're talking continue? about Catman. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's people out here that want to hear the story again or have not heard it, haven't heard our older episodes. Or my version of it. <laughs> <laughs> I love oh that. God. Okay. So his facial features made him look like a cat. And so his name, unfortunately, his nickname was Catman. Whoa, I did not see that coming. <laughs> the cemetery even lies off of Catman Road. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I, okay. See? After his death, Leroy Hudson, Catman, was buried in a mausole mausoleum in Long Cemetery along with his wife and other family members. Oh, so she, I mean, he wasn't that unattractive. He had a wife and he did. He had a family. Yeah. He might have died, but his spirit still remains in the cemetery, keeping it clear of nighttime visitors. People claim to hear voices, feel chills, and have a great desire to just get the heck out of the cemetery. Well, yeah, <laughs> if you're breaking the law by being in there, I would. I would assume so, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Some even during the daylight hours. Mm. <laughs> but then what happens next is something that has been reported over and over again. The visitors' cars will not start. Was something stopping them from leaving? Because... Of all the rumors of haunting at the cemetery, the mausoleum became a place of interest and investigations. Okay. So cars won't start. Mausoleum. Catman's in there. Let's investigate. Got it? Are you with me? Yes, absolutely. It's unfortunately also a place for vandals to do their thing. In 1994, at the request of the family, the mausoleum was torn down and the bodies within were reinterned in separate graves. This, of course, included Catman's body. Witnesses at the mausoleum, after it was open, claimed that they saw what looked like scratch marks on the inside of the structure. People are scratch sick. Marks. This is just a guy. Scratch marks that looked very similar 
to claw marks from a large cat clawing on the stone wall. Paranormal investigators have called the cemetery intense and very haunted. A group of teens having a bit of a party in the cemetery reported seeing a dark shape that looked like a man standing in the distance, then slowly walking towards them. I don't know what they were smoking, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the ghost of Catman's wife, perhaps Catwoman, has also been spotted <laughs> in the area. Oh, no. Where the mausoleum once stood. Now, remember, I said that it has often occurred that a person's car would not start. Well, legend has it that there's a crumbled brick wall at the back of the cemetery. If you dare to knock on it three times, Catman will mess with your vehicle. I don't know why you'd want that, but anyway. Why would you want that to happen? Further. Furthermore. If you knock on the wall three times, and every time you knock, you say Catman, then there's a chance that he will appear, or a chance that he'll mess with your car, or if you're lucky, both will happen. Oh, if you're lucky, he'll appear, and you'll be stuck. And Now, I ponder the question. Catman wants you out of the cemetery, and yet he stalls your car. Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. <laughs> Get out! But I'm going to break your car. So, <sighs> two places that cars stall. So, I was looking for a drink called Stalled Car. <laughs> Did you find stalling. anything? Oh. No, Swamp is better. <laughs> That's funny. Those are just fun legends from Delaware. I'm Delaware. I'm sorry I covered your... I I thought it was vaguely familiar, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I covered Catman because y'all know how much I love cats. That's why I covered it. <laughs> it's for you. Great minds think alike, Mom. <laughs> Oh, loved it so much. Had to share it twice. <laughs> yeah, I remember the brick wall part of the story and the car is getting stuck. And I watched, I remember watching a YouTube video. God, this was, this was one of our earlier episodes. It was, it was. Um, but about this guy and the whole drive out to the cemetery, though, it's like, it's not paved. It's a dirt road and there's like tons mm -hmm. of holes in it. Like Catman Road. Road. Yeah, and so he's like, well, no wonder people's cars stall because <laughs> I don't know how the heck I'm going to get out of here. It's like a horrible road that really rocks your car. So <laughs> anyway. That or else uh, somebody in a, a YouTube that I was watching, he said, you know, if you're so scared, if you're running out of the cemetery because of your mind telling you that there's a ghost or something there, and you're so scared you're going to sit behind that car and it's going to stall because you're going to give it too much gas. You're going to whatever, you know, especially if you're driving an old clunker. So it's like That's it, some of it is scary, just very though. explained why your car stalls. I guess, I, I guess this is a paranormal portion, mom. This is, you know, okay. I should imagination wander cat man. I mean, we've had. I mean, granted, Cordelia Botkin was a bad person, but frumpy and stout and Catman, oh, just the name calling labeled, in this episode. We've labeled people tonight. I mean, poor Pete and I mean. <laughs> Would you stop with the Pete already? <laughs> oh, well, this was a fun episode, Mom. It, it was. It was light this time. We're keeping it a light. A little this more time. light. Uh, what? Where are we covering next episode? You told uh, me. South Carolina. Yeah, South Carolina. That's what you said. I, I, I sent know. it to you. Was it South Carolina? Yeah. Yeah, South Carolina. Okay. Okay. Great. <clears throat> South Carolina, and that's all I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I
resources for this episode are going to be on our website, website, killerhangoverpodcast.com. There's a place on our website where you can message us your stories or just message us or just comment. Can you do us a favor and do that for us to help us with our, our website? Um, also, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe, like, follow, do all the YouTube things. We really appreciate it. Yes, we and do. if you're listening on a podcast platform, if you do the same, that would be fantastic. Rate uh, us, leave a comment. We really appreciate it. Um, you can also join us on Patreon, where we have an episode come out every week. Little extras and goodies and giveaways and fun stuff there. Um, all the links to all of our social medias and um, Patreon and all that's on our website. It's also going to be in the description of this episode. Anything else that I've forgotten my little spiel there, Mom? I think you're good. <laughs> okay. Well, this is a good one. Cheers, Mama. It was a good one. Sweet. Cheers. <laughs> Love you, kid. <laughs>